This is our latest uh, show in our series, Lexington Remembers, uh, it, uh, which gives us a chance to talk with people who uh, have memories of, of Lexington, going back, what it was uh, like, how it's changed, and so on. And I've uh, really been looking forward to this show with uh, Shirley Stoltz and Sandra Shaw, uh, both of whom uh, were here in town as uh, very young people. Um, and maybe that's a good place to start. Uh, Shirley, you know, when did you come to Lexington? Well, I came, I was, <laughs> as we were having a little discussion about whether, if you're born here, or you have to be born here. I was born in Sims Hospital, but my family, my grandfather moved to Lexington in 1906. And this is always a memorable date in our family because he always said we could remember when oh, he moved to Lexington because there was 1906 over the library, over oh. the front door of the library. So grandfather moved to Lexington. He lived on Mass Avenue, not far from the little stone store, about, you know, almost at the top of what we call Concord Hill. Mm -hmm. And so from there, uh, he had already two, two children, my, my father and my aunt, Edith, and my uncle that I never met were all born in Somerville. But when they came to Lexington, they entered Hancock School. And that's where I sort of have begun from, from there. And uh, the Little Stone store, was it there? No, that's a good story. My grandfather was involved in town politics. And uh, when they wanted to build this little store across the street, he said, fine. Oh, I, I don't mind their having a little store there, but I want it to be very sturdy. So I want to have it made out of stone. And so there it stands, and this will be known by the little stone store. And it yeah. was really a, a great place for us when we were young because we could just run up there and get a quart of milk or the hamburger was marvelous. The Breslin's ran a great store. So that was how that got to be. The Breslin's ran that? Yeah. Oh, because they had I can't tell you if they always ran it because mm -hmm. I didn't pay much attention to it. But I know, you know, Jake, was uh, who ran the store, a lot of the times that I remember, sat behind me in first grade. Well, the Breslins ran a store over in my neighborhood of where I oh, lived. Oh, that, that was the, the, the brother. Okay, because Bob Breslin was in my high school class, and his mm -hmm. father, I think, ran that. Right where Dunkin' Donuts is now? Yeah, right. Um, Waltham and... and it was uh, because Maryland. it had to be... Yeah. wasn't room for, for, for two people in that one little store. Right, no, that's, yeah. And your neighborhood was? East Lexington. Uh -huh. uh, I grew up in East Lexington, and the biggest difference that I've noticed in Lexington is the, um, is the, is the coming of affluence. Um, because when I grew up, East Lexington was really, m most of it, and I was near the Arlington Line. I was actually um, Cliff Ave off Bow Street, which the Cataldo Celery Farm was across the street. And it was really a working class neighborhood. I mean, um, back in the 40s and, the, and 50s, we never had a car, and a lot of our people, neighbors, never had cars. We walked to Arlington Heights. Typically, my mother would walk down there and get her grocery shopping and bring it back, carry it back. Of course, she went more than once a week. But um, my dad had a garden where we grew all our vegetables. And But the, but the difference, I see, uh, having lived here now most of my life, um, that, that before there was more diversity economically. Um, now there's diversity racially, but in those days it was not racially diverse at all, but, um, but it was economically diverse. I grew up rather, my father was a blue-collar worker. We had very little money, but I didn't really notice it. I was a happy child. We had four children. My mother sewed, made our clothing. She made, she canned all the vegetables from the garden. She, um, you know, she was involved in the community. Certainly, that's probably where I... Now, now on Bow Street or near Bow Street, I'm on Cliff. Where, is your house still there? My house is Cliff Avenue, 9 Cliff, the first one, right off Bow. Okay. My neighbor was Jim Barry, okay, uh, yeah. his family, yeah. the Barry family. 
Yeah. Again, no cars. <laughs> um, and the celery farm was across from Jim's house on Bow Street. But, you know, that whole area. I, it's amazing. I still like celery because I like it a lot. But it was, that's all you could smell in the summertime. is celery. <laughs> and um, it was really, you know, really interesting. And then they used to package it in the store in a, in a building next to Adams School, which is still there, which is part of the Waldorf. I think it's the high school part. Mm -hmm. That was Gold Ribbon Farms. That was the name of the Cataldo business. And they had workers coming in from the city, um, minority people, like mostly I think Puerto Rican or Portuguese, working on the farm and packaging the celery. And I remember coming home from school on the school bus, on the bus, the regular bus. And when we stopped right there by Sacred Heart, for these people to get on the bus, you could just the smell of celery would just be in the bus, and it was, they say. And, and the farm was actually on Bow Street? Yeah, it was on Bow Street, between Bow Street and the Arlington Res, running up the hill to there. They had a house at the top of the hill, um, mm -hmm. the Cataldos. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as I say, that was that was a farm area. And that's Bob, Bobby Cataldo's father. father. Yes. Was there. Was the, was the owner of the, that farm. I forget his name. I didn't mm -hmm. really know him that well. But we had a lot of Italians up over the hill, and that whole area was mm -hmm. was Italian. And I know, yeah. again, you you don't think about that until later. But you know, the Scope Pete Scoper, who became a policeman, there were Mangelis, there were um, uh, Moretti's, um, who was a baseball coach at one of my. There was a lot of Italian people, and again, working people, working class, no cars. This is the thing that my kids have trouble understanding, is that. We never had a car until I was, my parents had been married maybe 25 years. The reason why we never had a car, can I just say, we never had the money. And in those days, you did not charge something. We had no charge, uh, there were no charge cards. Um, we didn't have checking accounts. If you didn't have the money, you didn't buy it. So my grandfather in Maine died in 52 or 3 and gave us some small inheritance, like $4,000 when they sold it. And we were able to buy a car, a new Chevrolet, and a refrigerator that worked, and a furnace got rid of the coal that was down in the basement. Oh, I remember <laughs> that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, but boy, have things changed. I was at Wagon Wheel the other day. Some lady came in and bought an apple, one apple, and and gave the clerk a charge card for one <laughs> apple. I thought this was pretty yeah. hard. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> and you lived right across from the stone store? No, my grandfather's house was there. Okay, so Dan just asked me where I, where my family house was. We were across from Hastings Park. The house, of course, is still there. And, and um, my grandfather was diagonally up the hill. And then when his daughter Edith married, he built her a house above the next, he owned a lot, so he put, he put a house on that. And the house was designed by Willard Brown, who was a ar local architect of some degree of fame around mm -hmm. Lexington because he designed the library and I think mm -hmm. he was part of the design mm -hmm. team for the uh, Cary Memorial Hall. I think he worked, I think he worked on it whether he's the major or the minor architect, I'm not sure, because I think that Roger Greeley was also, it was maybe Roger Greeley's firm, I'm not quite sure about mm -hmm. that. Roger's was downtown, though, from downtown Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my father was really, it's a completely different segment of, of uh, the population. My father belonged to the group that rode the train to Boston. They were in the what did he do? He was in the insurance industry. Uh, my grandfather entered that industry when he was young. Mind you, with no college education, it wasn't necessary those days in order to have a career. But they rode the train to Boston. My father joined after, after World War I. He went into the firm. Now he himself, when he was a kid, thought he was going to be a farmer. And he went to uh, Cornell Agricultural School and he was all set to be a farmer until he discovered that if he had enough money to buy a farm, that he'd be far better off to invest it otherwise. And so he decided that wasn't such a smart idea. 
But he always had a marvelous garden in our backyard, mm -hmm. so we had fresh vegetables all the time. Yeah. And he used to, every spring, get a load of manure from Timmy, Timmy Sullivan, who lived up the street. And uh, it was kind of like an annual event to order in the, <laughs> in the manure. And in the backyard is a, is a chunk of brook that goes out into the wetland across from, oh, yeah. from uh, Hastings Park and goes down through Word, what's now Worthen Road. But when I was young, that area where um, Grace Chapel, that whole area of Worthen Road, was, uh, was open land, mostly swampish. And when we were kids, we played uh, on the top of Robinson Hill, which is behind. And Stratum that Road. whole territory was ours. Is that Stratum Road going Yeah, Strat Stratum Road. Because yeah. um, it was swamp at the time of the Revolution, that whole area back of the, believe it. back in there. Hastings uh, Park was kind of kind of wet when I was very little because I can remember my father taking me over there to go skating, taking right across the street, of course. Yeah, yeah. And, and why did your grandfather move here? I suppose he wanted to be out in the country, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, what he bought was a big chunk of land. With, I think, I don't believe he built the house. It was a pre-existing house, but it probably was built around, very nearly around 1900, I'm not quite sure. Now, I, when I, finally came back to Lex when I had enough money to move to Lexington when Nor after Norman and I were married, then we first lived on Parker Street, 11, number 11 Parker Street, sort of behind the pool. And uh, when we had a, our third child, we decided it was time to find something bigger. And so we went back up the hill to a house that belonged to the Rosenbergers, the one that we now live in. and. Um, at the time, we thought, we were pretty poor, at least we thought so, that it was just an awful stretch. We had bought the Parker House, Parker Street uh, house for $12,000, and we sold it for sixteen. dollars And then we made the big leap to twenty-five. dollars I was $22,100. What year? That would be 1956. Yeah, I bought my house. And Pharaoh Stride for twelve thousand five hundred. Uh, I don't think you could get it for that today. No, 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 no not, even, not even the car in the yard. Hey, not even the yeah, garage. Right. Right. And your family? Well, that's interesting because um, the house, my grandfather actually, uh, my mother's dad, they lived in Arlington on uh, Dudley Street in a two-family at the when my mother was born in 1902, and they moved to Lexington uh, right around 1926, because um, my, my mother got married in that house, which I couldn't believe. It's a tiny house. I said, "Didn't you have wedding guests? I mean, where were they?" Because it's, it's very small and it's the same because there's no land to expand that house except there's a little piece where my dad gardened, which isn't really, you couldn't build on it. I mean, it was just, a, you know, a strange shape. Anyway, so my parents of it that lived in Arlington, when they got married in 1926, they lived in Arlington renting a two, again, a two family. And, um, and then my, my grandmother died, evidently, and he, um, my John Sumner, remarried and so my parents, in 19, I guess, 42, as far as I were able to buy the house from them for very low money, mm -hmm. which I always said I wouldn't have been in Lexington without subsidized housing, truthfully. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I've always been very sympathetic to getting people into town that otherwise couldn't afford it. That's mm -hmm. a sidebar. But, so we were able to move to Lexington, um, and it was wonderful. I went to Adams School. This is the other thing I have to bring up now. The difference, the differences are many, but the big one is we lived practically on the Arlington Line, and I went to Adams School every day. I walked, no car in the family, and nobody drove a car to school ever. No. And I walked without my parents. Uh, I was five years old when I entered the first grade. I just did, you know, um, 
And I walked. No, preschool. A mile oh, on the main street. Uh, I walked. At yeah. And um, that was fun. I liked it. We had all kinds of adventures along the way. I mean, we did. Oh, yes. One time, though, I was throwing snowballs at a truck. That, that wasn't too good. He stopped. So. <laughs> and I ran. But, you, you know, you had a chance to develop your own independence, which I think has yeah. um, something I, I needed because, again, I, we never had much money, so you had to. I worked in high school and so forth so that I could go to school. But uh, this whole difference of, of I live near Bridge School, and you can't even, if you happen to go by at the wrong time, forget about it. You don't get by. There are nine million cars in a queue, getting in, people up the street who live on two blocks from the school, uh, walk their children to school every day. I mean, I, I just think the kids are missing something. I know that the safety issues, and certainly with that many cars going to the school, there's a safety issue right away. You've got cars run, boom, 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 boom. And I think I'd probably worry about my kids walking today, but never my children, who my eldest is 50 now, uh, went, walked, were able to walk from our home in Watchers to drive to, of course, to Bridge, and then to Clark, and then to the high school. And we never drove them either. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I kind of rail at the idea of having to drive children or have their own cars even today, of course, in Lexington, uh, in high school. Um, I, I just think that uh, that part of it I don't like. I think mm -hmm. you need to get out and walk and exercise and, and have a chance to be on your own mm -hmm. and be with your friends and talk and, and just develop. So that, that's a big, big change I see that I think is unfortunate and I don't know what you can do about it. Uh, and, and it's kind of a, a, a long walk. You were saying your mother walked to Arlington Heights yeah. from Bow Street. Less than a mile, less than a mile. It is to oh, Arlington yeah. Heights? Oh, sure. Less than a mile. Yeah, I walked down there all the time. I went to church in Arlington as, a, as growing up all the way through to the Arlington First Baptist Church, which was down by the center. And we walked to the Heights, got on the trolley, and went down and went to our church. And we did it every week. And again, I never thought that I was, uh, you know, too bad for you. You, have, you don't have a car. I was happy when we finally got a car. It made, made life easier, certainly. But um, it wasn't unusual, I guess is what I'm saying. The people used public transportation. Yeah. Um, oh. It was there. The bus also, of course, went from the Heights up to the center and beyond. Yeah, the white bus. And, uh, yeah, well, it was the maroon bus. Oh, well, it, it changed color. <laughs> it, was the, it was the B and A, Boston and something. Boston and Maine? No, not Maine. No. Um, anyway, I don't remember the exact company. B and M. No, but not Maine. Boston and Middlesex, I think. Could be, yeah. So, but my mother remembers, this is interesting, she remembers the park up near um, the Bedford Line that, that Mickey oh, Hankel yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Mickey Hankel, was, who was former writer with the Miniman, as most people remember, Alice Hinkle, Mickey, was, was, was a dear friend of mine, and she interviewed my mom, she was doing a story on Lexington Park which my mother, as, as a six-year-old living in Arlington, remembered getting on a trolley which went up Mass Avenue to Bedford, the Bedford Line. Mm -hmm. it, and the reason they developed that trolley, it, it turns out, in, in like 1910 uh, or 9 or something like that, was it was developed by the people that ran Lexington Park. And it was a way to get people to the park out well, of the city. They rode the train out and then they... Well, this yeah, they, they, from the city, and then they they got on the trolley. I thought it was um, it, was it Arlington Heights actually the trolley started. Well, I, I thought maybe it was Lexington Center. I really can't tell you. No, no. Sure. I remember there were trolley tracks still yes. in the yeah. in the. Yeah. I mean, in on early when I in Mass Avenue in the center. Yeah. I bet if you dug it up today, there'd probably be some trolley but tracks the in there. But the Lexington Park concept blew my mind because and my mother, I I had to get her talking more because she had of course a terrific memory all the way through, thank God. But she would go there, and she was a musician. She taught piano um, while I was growing up and for a long time to help bring money in. There was, she loved the music. They had this like a natural amphitheater, evidently, yeah. on the rocks. And she said, and they put on dance productions. She didn't care about the animals, which there were. I said, what about the bears? They're supposed to be big. Oh no, the productions. Oh, they were amazing. But she was six or seven, riding the trolley up with her sisters, again, no parents, 
safe times yeah. and would go to this and and uh, so Mickey wrote it I have that story Mickey um, wrote a story about that which I, I myself hadn't known all the facts and the park was up uh, where sort of where drummer boy is now yes yes, 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 yeah. oh, and um, it uh, it was an amusement park and it ultimately moved to New Hampshire. Benson's. And was Benson's, Benson's Animal, Animal Farm. Farm. And I used to go to Benson's Animal I did, Animal yeah, Farm. yeah. We that did, was yeah, a great place. Yeah. And when did the park uh, close? You remember? Uh, you know, I don't remember that, but it had to be quite early. It had to be before before you, you were. I mean, the thing is, because when you participated in the playground program in the summertime, since I live very near the town pool, yeah. it had just been built, <laughs> actually. Vienna, yes. uh, I learned to swim there. Uh, one of the things you did in the summertime is you, it was almost like a, a day camp that was run by the town. Yeah. There was something to do practically every minute all day. And the reward for participating in the various activities, you got points or something or other for everything that you did. And if you did enough things, then you got to go to Benson's Wild Animal Farm. Okay, so season. it had moved by that time. That so I'm just saying that sort of didn't that pinpoints at least some part of it. The pool opened, I think, in 1920. Or, or, no, I think it was later than later. That. Okay. Yeah. All I know I, is I learned to swim in it. Yeah, me yeah. too. Me too. But the but the uh, Lexington Park was was gone by then. Oh yeah, well, I, I think before the it was 20s, not part of my job. I was, before the twenties, I, I was. I mean, I'm guessing. I think so. I, but I yeah. think so. I've never heard it mentioned. Maybe except. World War Two killed it. I don't know. There's some wonderful uh, uh, oh, postcards yeah. of it. Oh yeah. Um, yes. Well, so so you went to Adams and you went to Hancock. Right. And and Adams School was uh, very free and easy and. Oh, uh, I loved it. We had wonderful grounds. I mean, it, yeah. and so. Out the and, back. There. Yes, yeah. and when, and during play and, and during lunch hour, we got to go out and play after lunch for a half an hour. We had recess and then we had lunch, and we used to go way down, sort of near where the and there were railroad tracks, of course, then. Right. Uh, and we would, there were big trees, and we would have forts, and we would be playing, and we were very, again, independent. There were no teachers walking around saying, where are you going? I mean, we were just off having our adventures in a short time. But the interesting thing about, um, for me, about Adams School, too, is that my grandmother, Elin Sumner, who was a, an immigrant from Sweden, was, and they lived in, in, in Cliff Avenue at that time. She was the first uh, president of the PTA that was started at Adams School, and I forget exactly when that would have been, 1915. And then my mother, when I was in at Adams School, which was from 44 to 50, she was the the president of the PTA. And when I came on the school committee in 1979, we closed Adams School. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it was That's like a oh, full circle. But you never would have closed it, Miss Morrison. Oh, in there. <laughs> Miss Morrison she uh, was scared. So as I remember, Miss Morrison, uh, she was very free and easy, and it was. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you don't right. remember her at all. <laughs> so what was Adam School like? Miss Morrison was a well, pretty tough lady, the principal. She was a scary woman, <laughs> but luckily we had some wonderful teachers, and I had some great teachers, and um, we were pretty insulated within our classrooms. Um, I, I actually had, for my first grade teacher, the woman, uh, Miss Quinn, her name was, and Billy Fitzgerald, she became. She died last year, oh. and she was my first grade teacher, and we stayed close through all these years. I would visit with her. She went to our church occasionally, Hancock, after her husband died, because he was Catholic, and she said he wouldn't hear of that, but she went, <laughs> she went back to Hancock. And so I got to see her again, but when I was um, speaking to Ms. Morrison and, and what she was, Miss Quinn, her name was Wilma Quinn, and she became Billy Fitzgerald when she married uh, the fellow. Um, when I was at UMass, majoring in elementary education, and I think I was in my senior year or junior year, I came back to Adams School and visited with Miss Miss Quinn, and Miss Morrison came in and was an entirely different person, of course, at that time. She wasn't scary to me anymore. 
And they were so thrilled that I was going to become a teacher. I'm sorry, I didn't make it. <laughs> I tried. Um, so that they had me talking to the first graders that I was in this class, you know, umpty ump years ago. It was a beautiful classroom. It had a fireplace. It still probably does, but it was. In, it looked out at the railroad tracks. It was in the back of the school uh, on the first floor. A beautiful room to start school in, and Miss Quinn was lovely. And so it was just a, a great experience. And, and um, my teachers were all women, of course, who heard of a man teacher. But when you got to junior high school, and junior high school, when I went up there, was, was, the, was as you're looking at Muzzy, was the left side of the building, and right. the high school was the right mm -hmm. side. 7 through 9, 10 through 12. And so I was in the junior high school for three years. And then the new school up on Waltham Street opened in 1954. And in my freshman year, in my ninth grade year, I remember the big thing that we remember, and we just recalled this at my uh, uh, high school reunion of 50th year a few years ago. We, walked, we had a parade from, from the school, from, um, from Muzzy, carrying books. I think they couldn't afford transport or something. So all of us kids were walking down Mass Avenue, then down Muzzy Street to the new school, very exciting, with the books. And um, there were pictures of that, I guess, too. Um, the school looked very different, though, in those days. There was, there was a big hole where the auditorium was. We didn't have an auditorium for the three years I was there. And we didn't have the wing, the science wing, and we didn't have the F, and whatever that is, the, the, the California campus look. It was just the main building. But um, we were, just, I was telling my grandson, who was a senior at the high school, Chris Shaw, this, you know, about this, that this was historic. And of course, you know, it's like, that's yeah, such yeah. a long time ago. I said, yeah. you know, that's a new school. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. No, 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 not and, a new school. And, and uh, I remember Miss Morris, and I remember if she was scary to you, she was scary to a lot of superintendents, too. <laughs> Mr. Grindle? Well, I don't know about Mr. Mr. Grindle. Mr. was a nice cat. Oh, he was, yeah. Because <laughs> he kind of grew up way. with her, but... Uh, Oh, that's uh, it. Medell yeah. Bear and, yes, and, yeah. uh, and Rudy Fulbert. Medell Bear is it, the one who didn't hire me. Really? Right. Because yeah. I was getting married. I'm shocked. I was really shocked. really because he was pretty good. He was a good guy. Yeah. Well, that was, the, that was the rule then. I mean, they had an unwritten rule that you didn't hire people that might get uh, have a baby. Yeah. And they'd have to then hire someone else. So yeah. that was too much work for them. Then they didn't have a problem with candidates, evidently. So who'd you go to school with? Well, in my class was uh, someone who's still in Lexington. It's Bill Daly, of course. Well, we had him on the show yeah. a little while ago. Bill was, Bill was a lot of fun, um, grade one through six. And then he went to, um, because he was a wild person, no, I like to kid him. And he went to the uh, parochial school, St. Mary's, over in Waltham. Uh huh. So the nuns could handle him. That was. I see. <laughs> that was a. He was no. He was a great guy, and he was in the class. And um, Bob McNamara was in, mm -hmm. who was still in town. And of course, mm -hmm. Bob, who owns um, the coal and Arlington Coal mm -hmm. and Lumber, what do they call it now? But that was her, Mary, his wife's family's a business. He was in my high school class. Uh, he went to Hancock. But, Jim Barry. Uh, no, no, Jim no. was Jim was graduated from high school the year I was born. Oh, oh, yeah. Let's keep yeah, that. Right. Yeah, Jim used to say, "I remember you," and I said, "No, you don't, Jim. You had left for the war or whatever. You don't. I don't remember." You. But he he thought he did. Um, I don't know who else would have been. Uh, Any of the Wilsons? Lynn Wilson was a year, two years ahead of me, um, at, at the high school. And um, not in my class, no. Mm -hmm. But I knew, and Alan Wilson was uh, already out of high school. But I, but I used to work at Wardrobe's Pharmacy when I was in oh, high school yeah. uh, because I needed to make some money for college. And um, Roland Wardrobe was this wonderful man who owned the store, and he hired people like myself. So there were about five of us who were families from not well off and needed to work. 
And, and so that was a great experience. And, and Alan Wilson had graduated and was working on the, in the little farm stand they had, which was such a, was really a farm stand. Uh, opened only in the summertime, of course. Would come in and have his raspberry and lime, and, and I was a soda jerk, and I would, you know, make the drinks and so forth. But Roland used to allow us to do other things, like I was a, a majorette in Don Gillespie's band, and, and uh, had to march at the football games and so forth. And he would always allow for that, and he'd say, you can come in and work from six to nine, no problem. You know, he, it, so he was a wonderful, wonderful guy and really helped some of us do what we had to do in order to um, graduate. And, and what were the classes like? Uh, uh, well, he, uh, pretty strict and, and a lot of memorization? Uh, well, the thing about Hancock is that I think that it was just enough earlier before you went to school that uh, it was somewhat, somewhat different. But to go back to one thing that you said, this business of walking to school. We walked to school, we walked home for lunch, we walked back home, back mm -hmm. to school after lunch. And the only people that got to eat lunch at school were those youngsters who came by bus. And they came, uh, in our end of town, more of the families were Irish than Italian. And they mm -hmm. did do, do some farming. Uh, but again, I wasn't quite aware of the, the horizon beyond my little enclave, because my mother didn't drive. We had a car, but she didn't drive. So again, I walked everywhere. I walked to Girl Scouts all the way up to a house on Granny Pond. I walked back and forth to school. I played in the woods by the water tower. I used to climb the water tower when I was a kid. It was wonderful, exciting. <laughs> Very you dangerous. were a scamp. <laughs> there was a cement water tower with a whirly, whirly thing, and that was, yeah. that was okay. You were sort of enclosed. And then they built a new water tower, and it was all on the outside with only two platforms, and the rungs were, were, diet, were, were square, and it kind of hurt your heads. So it felt a little more dangerous than being oh. in this wiry cage that went. They took down, I guess, the cement water tower and built another one. But, uh, we had a gang that went to school, walked back yeah. and forth to school, and in my neighborhood, by chance, there were mostly girls. There were a few boys. Don Nickerson was one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Don Nickerson, was he a teacher later? No, no he was so, a no, chairman of the Board of Select. Oh, oh, that's another Nickerson. His father was, was on the Board of Select. No, he was a Board of Appeals, I think. Yeah, but he was also so on the Board of Select. Select. Yeah. He was a very imposing fellow. Oh yes, he was. <laughs> but that was our neighborhood, and uh, we had a, had an absolute blast. But everybody, yeah. East Lexington and the center, everybody sort of came together on April nineteenth. Oh yes. Right? Oh, oh, I love never that missed April nineteenth. We used to bicycle up from uh, my girlfriend and I, Lois Rowe. We used to bicycle up early in the morning, if we weren't marching with the Girl Scouts, which most of the time we weren't. We would bicycle up. We had I, I have this in my diary at home, 1949. I was in the fifth grade. I had 85 cents, and I wrote down what I bought. And I was like, whoa, this is big money. A hot dog, you know, 15 cents, a balloon, 10 cents, uh, Coca-Cola, 5, or whatever. And I had, whoa, we were just in, in heaven. Because we'd go up there, we'd watch the parade, we'd go up to the green, we'd have our snacks, we'd get, you know, just see our friends watch the afternoon parade, and then bicycle home. It was a huge day, and I think it still is pretty, pretty good. And was the morning parade still, when did they have the morning parade? Yes. Oh, oh, yes. Were you a Girl Scout? For one year. That's, and then our leaders left, and so that was, oh. it was in seventh grade, though. See, that was uh, older. I wasn't, a, I was not interested in, in the movement, except we had wonderful, um, what do you call them, scout leaders. Well, the thing is, I think that, when I was going to school, everybody in the whole class practically was a Girl Scout. Oh. It was just the thing to do. We had a lot. We had and we had some very, you know, really remarkably good um, experiences. Oh, we um, went to, we had great experiences for that one year. We went to Children's Museum. I mean, I learned you know, about they made weather. all kinds of field trips. 
Yeah. We went to a Ford factory. Yeah, we, we were going we went to, to an ice cream factory. We went to lots of places yeah. that were absolutely intriguing. I never remember the Ford factory. I couldn't believe that one man could spend a whole day doing nothing but putting five bolts on a wheel. I thought, did, what a terrible way to Did look you up. go to Cedar Hill for the go oh, yes. camping? As a matter of fact, later on, I was a Girl Scout leader myself. Oh. <laughs> and I remember camping out at Cedar Hill with my neighbor across the street who was also, but at any rate, but Scouts because, were fun. Cedar Hill was a And I, I, I learned a lot. Oh. That was the whole point. Yes, you did. Do you, how many badges did you get? Oh, stillings of them. <laughs> I had them all up and down my sleeves. Yeah. I was wondering what what the the class was like, what your day was like in, in school, in Hancock and, and in Adams, because <laughs> uh, my, my grandchildren and <clears throat> in elementary school, a lot of conversation, a lot of moving around, a lot of no, no, informality. Well, things were predictable. You started off in first grade, and uh, you, uh, they always knew exactly what they were going to do. You already knew in first grade what you were going to study in second grade, in the third grade, in the fourth grade. You knew exactly what teacher you were going to have, because the teachers never moved. They were always the same teachers, pretty much. From the beginning mm -hmm. to the end, I think almost the whole time I was in school, all the teachers were the same teachers. We had some only, changes. Only, uh, I remember, second grade teacher was named Miss Blodgett, and she had a big old, huge car. Didn't suit her personality at all, but there she had it, and and it had little shades that you pull down in the rear. Oh. And the big important thing that happened was the snow fell off the roof at Hancock School one winter day and almost caved a car in. <laughs> that, was a, that was a big problem. That was our, server, right? Well we, we just, well, we just couldn't understand, you know, how she could have parked it there, but then she did. But um, the most, I think that uh, Miss White was in fourth grade was the one that, she was sort of classy. She, she, she dressed more, <clears throat> she was more elegant than any of the other teachers. And oh, I think I enjoyed her the most because she was the most challenging. They were all. But I remember being bored. Oh, none of them were married. No, 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 no. I could be being bored out of my skull sitting in these classes where you had to do flashcards. You know, you know, two times ten times three is what. You know, and on and on and on and drone, drone, what drone, drone, drone. So bored. No, I was bored because I could already do it. Why did I have to keep doing it over and over and over again? Oh, it really? seemed like we should do something more. Yeah, I think it changed. In the, I was in the forties, um, and we. I did, think curriculum really improved. We had we had reading groups. You know, you were you were in oh, yeah, the first grade, so second reading group, third, depending on your proficiency. We had um, a couple of married teachers in our school at the time. Maybe one, actually one, Mrs. Fitzgerald. <clears throat> uh, not Miss Quinn. This is another one, Bell Bella Fitzgerald. But we had, um, we did a lot of penmanship, which is something you, oh, you yes. don't see now when you had the, you had the Palmer method, oh, yes. cards around the top, so if you were doing an F, you would look up and say, okay. And I mean, to this day, I think my handwriting is very good. My kids, you know, think, what are you, wow, you can really write, they print and all this yeah. cursive writing. I said, well, this is, you know, this is your personality, this is, um, this was how we were taught, and it's important, I think it's important, you have to have a signature. Um, and we also uh, did a lot of reading, um, and the teacher would read to us, even when we were older. But like what? What would they read? Well, Dick the, and Jane? There was a horse. There was no, no, no. The teachers, really that was the movie. reader. That was the, we would do Dick and Jane. But um, the teacher, we did Dick and Jane. First yeah. couple of years, anyway. Um, but the, but I liked, I loved hearing the teacher. If there was some time in the afternoon, she'd say, okay, and she'd take out her book and read Black Beauty, or she, she was Misty of Chincoteague. I mean, there was, it was, we loved, I loved listening to the story. She was, um, they were good readers and developed, and being also right next to the library, East Lexington Library, I would go and get books. And um, in my own home, we didn't have any books. I mean, my parents were not college people and my sisters were not. And so I would go to the library. And then in the summer, they had a contest. I, I'm very competitive. You would, if you read 25 books, you got 
an, an award, which was just a piece of paper. But boy, I wanted that. So, um, you know, I read a lot of books. And like kids, what books did you Oh, well, I like. read, that, you know, I read everything that they had in there that was appropriate for my age level. Like um, books like Sue Barton, War Nurse. Um, I like books where women were heroic, and there were many in books. Um, and just, I just remember reading a lot of books. I can't remember that many titles. I remember very well because I... Uh, Somehow or other, I knew how to read when I was in first grade. I, don't, I just don't remember how I learned to read, but I could read. And uh, I remember getting my first book out of Cary Library when I got my own first library card every uh, Friday night. The whole family would go downtown. I guess we did go by car in that case. And uh, we went to the economy store. I remember the big cookie jars, cookie Fats. You could buy buy cookies by the one, if you want, or by the pound or whatever. And uh, we went to the library to renew whatever books we had to begin all over again. And the thing about the library is that that was a closed stacks for children up to a certain age. In other words, the, all the bad books were on the other side of the line or whatever. And what was considered a particularly bad book was Gone with the Wind. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it was just too something or other. So we weren't allowed to read Gone with the Wind unless you got it something. Or Anthony Adverse. That was the <laughs> well, other I don't know, but yeah. anyhow, I just I just read my eyes out. There's no question about it. Yeah. Uh, when I could go to the library by myself, which I did pretty soon, because again, as we were saying, we we had free free rent. We could just walk anywhere. And you probably didn't have a I didn't worry about it. Like my, right? my mother never worried about me. Did you have a television set competing with this? Oh, no, just no, television. Just I used to li be <laughs> I used to listen to the radio yeah, with Tom radio. Mix oh, yeah. and and uh, I was Little Love Jack Nanny. Armstrong, Lux Little Love Nanny. I can remember being glued to the to the radio Manchu, the when my family got a radio. Lux yeah. presents Hollywood. Oh, I like the plays. I like the plays. We did get a TV set in 1950. Or well, I was married when I got one. Yeah. Well, and we never had one growing up, but then um, we had a very small living room, and we had a piano in there that my mother taught piano. And people say, well, then you must have learned to play the piano, Sandra. And I said, darn it, I started to, but then we got a TV set. And <laughs> there wasn't room, so the TV was sort of in, in front of it, so that was the end of my piano career. Regrettably. <laughs> now, what about, uh, what about, churches. A lot of churches, people generally go to church or not much. We went, we went to Arlington, as I say, my parents had been married, uh, no, they were, well, they had been going to that since they were married, the First Baptist. But when I was in high school, I used to go with my friends, <clears throat> they belonged to the Unitarian Church, and they had square dancing um, uh -huh. once a month or something which, again, was a social opportunity that I wasn't going to miss. And so I went to that. We also had Miss, Miss um, Merrill's dancing school. Oh, yes. <laughs> when I was in the eighth grade, my parents, who had no money, and this was, I just told them till the day they died how much that meant to me, that they scraped up. My mother said, no, we're going we're gonna to get that for you. We're gonna, you're going to be able to go. Oh, thank God, because all my friends would go. And yeah. this was the big thing, to go to Miss Merrill's. And then you danced, and then you walked up to Duran's ice cream shop and had, <laughs> had your ice cream. We and where it was dance. just the Belfry Club? The Belfry Club. The Belfry Club was, was, was one of the places. The corner of right. uh, Muzzy and Parker. Right. right. Yeah, and they took that down not long ago. Uh, burned. It burned. 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 It burned down. Oh, it burned yeah. down? That yeah. was a sort of, I would call it, kind of a community center when I was growing up. Well, but you had to be a member. Yeah. Oh, you yeah, you did, just, but, but, but you know, yeah. wasn't, I wasn't allowed. <laughs> but yeah. that's where Miss Merrill's dancing class Yes, it was. Well, yes, yes. it was yeah. upstairs, yeah. Mr. Champagne was, was, a, was a teacher when I was there. And, and we went to ballroom dancing, and he brought along Mrs. Champagne, who was her version of Lovely, which I, I thought she was pretty icking myself. Yeah. <laughs> I do At the end of every, every session, they would do a demonstration of ballroom dancing. And all the fathers, except my brother, always wanted to pick up their kids. And the fathers would be sitting on the other side of the room watching Mr. and Mrs. Champagne put on their end of the, end of the 
session dancing demonstration, and it was just so funny. I, th I thought they were, fathers were kind of silly, but anyhow, we had a great time at the Belfry Club. Um, I remember seeing my first movie there, it was a Charlie Chaplin. I remember going to Valentine's party. I remember Selden Loring, uh, who... Uh, you don't mean the son, Denny. I mean Denny. Oh, okay. But I'm talking now about his father. He played right. Harvey in the right. play Harvey, and he was marvelous. Yeah, the Belfry Club was, as I remember, it was kind of, it wasn't anywhere near as important um, by the late 50s as it had been. No, I think it probably went downhill. People yeah. just really? weren't interested in it anymore. There was no, yeah. no one They built a little no. tennis court there, and I remember Larry Whipple used to play okay. tennis there. Yeah. I played with Larry sometimes. He was a very good tennis player. Yeah. You mentioned the movies, that which reminds oh, me, yeah. <clears throat> again, we used to go to the movies uh, well, every two weeks. Again, I had an allowance I could save. We would go to either the Capitol in Arlington or the Regent or Lexington. And we would, and this is again, my friend and I would take the bus or take the trolley. The Capitol was, was um, 20 cents, no, 16 cents. The, the Regent was 12 cents. And Lexington, the expensive, was 20 cents. Uh oh. And you could get a candy bar for a nickel, of course. So that was a big, uh, big thing to do. But we go down the truck, you know. When I think of the, my mother even let me go into Filene's basement uh, on the subway, and I was I was only in a, in in junior high and high school, like with my girlfriend. But we would walk to the Heights, get on the trolley, go to Habit Square, get on the subway, and shop, and come home. And um, you know, there was nothing. That's to me probably the biggest difference between yesterday and today is that t parents can't, don't, whatever, allow their children a lot of independence. I mean, because it's, it's supposedly, a, you know, a scarier it's world. It's a dangerous uh, world, but I don't think yeah. it's any more dangerous than it was. Well, it's just dangerous yeah. in different well, ways. Doesn't. Well, there is yeah. more traffic. <laughs> yeah. and, now, and I think that's dangerous. Lexington was uh, divided between the Yankees and uh, and the Irish and the Italians, with the Italians sort of concentrated in East Lexington, right? Oh yeah. And oh, and so. how did everybody get along? Just fine. Fine. I, I mean, the thing about uh, some of these, I think I always admired the kids that had to get up early in the morning and go out and do work before they even came to school. And they were big, strong kids. Danny Boozer was the was the uh, president of our, of our class. Uh, they were hardworking, good, good athletes. And uh, I think I just always admired them. They were they did live the same life as I did, but I still thought they were great. Well, my neighborhood, I had Italians right around me, and um, uh, as well as uh, they were up over the hill. But I enjoyed their food. I mean, this was a different. Uh, I remember. <laughs> That the lady behind us, she was actually married to a French guy, Mrs. Bavay, but she used to make fried eggplant sandwiches. I mean, I had never heard of such a thing as eggplant frying something in, you know, with the sauce. And that was because my mother was Swedish, wonderful cook, but, you know, more along traditional lines was the food we would have pot roast, chicken, you know, um, a lot of sweets and breads. <laughs> But the food from from the, these folks was uh, terrific, and no, we never thought about it. That um, the different any differences really. I, as I think, as long as you fit in economically, I think again was the we we all had so much in common in that sense. Our fathers went off. Um, my father took the train when it was running too. We lived. You could see the train from my house. Um, that's one more thing I have to mention that I remember very clearly. When I was in Adams School, we had, um, we had a, an accident. A fellow up the street, an older man, <laughs> who's probably my age, um, was walking across the tracks. He was deaf, and he got killed by the train. Mr. Shute, his name was Shute, C-H-U-T-E. And the, the story went that his, they found his shoe, and his foot was 
just took away that. And we were like, ooh, ee. And it was that, that accident really stayed with me. It's still with me, obviously. It was uh, such a shock. They didn't have at that time, they did afterwards, the ding, 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 oh, yeah. and, the, and the cross. We never had the arms that come down, but they had the lights put in, the red lights and the, and the noise. Um, so supposedly, you know, you would not. But well, we used to. I used to walk to school on the tracks because it was a straight shot from there oh, to yeah. Adams. Right. Wow. And, and and I never worried about a train coming on. There weren't too many well, when I was doing this. A few trains when I was a kid. I I rode the train myself to work. Uh, we did occasionally down to the uh, when I was before I was married and after college. I worked in Feliz in Boston, and I rode the train every day. Oh. And uh, the men's all. Uh, <laughs> Well, we're in a smoking car, but we we were about four of us that rode into Boston on the train together. We're kids that had gone to school together. How did you get from North Station over to Philly? Walked. <laughs> what else? I know. Yeah. I, 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 I still have that. I had, that too. I had the track record from my house to the train station in high heels. But not oh. this high. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I, I hear. I you know. I, I was a little bit late, and I'd hear the train in North Lexington. And I'd have to really turn it on to get oh, there. Sure. <laughs> and then we had a big a conductor whose name was Ryan. His last name was Ryan, but everybody just called him not Mr. Ryan, but Ryan. And he used to, I used to fall. I fell asleep on the train more than once. But then one night he really got me. He, we had stopped at Lexington Center, but he came down and he yelled right in my ear, North Lexington. <laughs> <laughs> I shot out of my seat and I looked, and we were just in Lexington Center. Oh. <laughs> Where did it stop in North Lexington? Don't ask. I never went that far. Yeah, it must have been. Yeah. It was probably. You know, I went to Bedford. What was the center like? Uh, now it's all banks, but... No, it was banks then. I mean, you know, No, we had Laurel Lanes, we had Bakers, we had Batemans. You had, you had um, department stores because there was no okay. Burlington Mall. It was Mall. Batemans. Bakers. And Bakers. And, and, and I remember when Duran's opened, Dottie Day was, was uh, very... She really put up with a lot because we used to go in and, you know, order only like ice cream cone or a soda and then sit there all have to take do. up space. Yeah. And I think there was a butcher shop. There was Scribner's Just, and there, yep. there was um, yeah. a hardware. There was a hardware. There was, there was, there was, uh, when I was young. Um, Lawrence's hardware? Or Lawrence's hardware. There was Rudd's, which is in the building. It was torn down. Is it now the Jeru building? Mm -hmm. But it was Rudd's. It was in that. And there's, there was a liquor store there. Ross and Ryan then I remember there. when Theater Pharmacy opened, when it first opened, they offered all the customers, they got kind of like coupons or something for shopping there. And I don't think I got enough coupons, I don't know what happened, but it was something that you could do with it. Well, the boys in school were kind of, had a little bit more freedom than we did. And they used to hang out outside of... I want to ask for them. And ask people <laughs> if they wanted their coupons. And so they'd accumulate enough to do oh, something. And then there was a, where uh, Douglas Funeral well, it was Douglas Funeral Home, but it isn't now. Next to the library. Next to the library, that building had an arcade, right, yeah, had an arcade in it. Yeah, Smith, the Smith's Paper Store. Yes, the the Smith's yeah. Paper Store was there. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the Lexington Savings. Lexington Trust, too. And the Trust Company, which was where... Uh, and there were apartments, I think. Yeah, yeah some of the people in my, my class at school lived above the, oh, above I, the I, grocery store. I wasn't store. aware that people lived in them. I thought I lived it was above the grocery store myself when we yeah. lived in Boston yeah. briefly. Makes sense. And the Drew building was several floors oh, high. Yeah, it was a big building. You couldn't yeah. see the green. Very unattractive. I, I worked yeah. one summer um, selling uh, tickets at the Lexington Theater uh, when I was 16. And so I was sitting in the little thing inside, uh, and I used to look out at that building and, and think, oh, that is the ugliest yeah, looking. Yeah, it was ugly. Was, yeah, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, now, both of you have um, uh, been extraordinarily active in town in leadership in a lot of different roles, and great, great citizens, and great contributors to the town. How, how, how come? I mean, well, I, no. you spent an awful lot of time in, in town, things, the two of you. 
Well, in my family, it was a tradition. I was going to my father and grandfather were both town meeting members. Now, in about 1920, 1921, they had an open town meeting up until that point. But then they had a big election, and any number of people ran. And uh, my father and my grandfather both got elected. And my father beat my grandfather by one vote. <gasps> oh, that's good. <laughs> so we, had to, I mean, we really talked politics. My uncle, not my uncle, but uh, my aunt's husband was on the Board of Appeals. Now, I had no idea what the Board of Appeals did, but it sounded important. And uh, I got involved in politics. I remember, I used to visit town meeting for reasons I can't remember, but I can remember getting absolutely furious. I think it was in 1956 when they, some motion to do something to do with the library failed. And I said, by golly, when I get a chance to, I'm going to be a town meeting member, because I want to change a few of the things around here. And so, later on, I did, in about 1968, I ran for town meeting. But I had been involved a little bit with the library. So that was one of, the, one of my motivations, was to support, to support some of the things that I believed in. And because it had been a family tradition. Yeah. And I remember my father saying that, I know more about politics than you'll ever know. And I said, oh, that was because he rode the train and they all decided affairs of the town while they were on the train, and I'm not quite sure whether that was true or not, but mm. I do know that he was good friends with people like George Morey, that would be Ruth Morey's husband, and some of these other gentlemen who worked in Boston as opposed to working in Lexington. Yeah. Yeah. And so from there I was, uh, I can't remember which came first. I, was, uh, I majored in biology when I was in college, and I was interested in the environment. Well, it wasn't called the environment then, but I was interested in, in uh, outdoors things, and somehow or other, I don't remember how, I got appointed to the Conservation Commission, and we had an absolute wonderful time. We didn't spend our time worrying about whether somebody was imposing on the wetlands. We were busy buying. Land. Oh, yes. Uh, I think the town got about, uh, appropriated about a million two or a million four, and we made that thing, that small, what would be now, a really yeah. tiny appropriation, go very far indeed. If you look in the town records, you'll find that during that period, somewhere in the late 60s, early 70s, the town was managed to pick up quite a bit of conservation land. And the only reason I stopped doing conservation is because Norman and I, my husband and I, decided to go sailing. And he had retired early and decided we'd take off on our 40-foot sailboat. and. and Correct. Indefinitely. Indefinitely. Which we did. Great. So that was how I got unhooked. Then, after I came back and we settled down and sold the boat, uh, I was sort of hanging loose. I really does. I mean, I'd had seven grandchildren, one every year practically, and I took help take care of them, helped take care of my aging mother, and. Uh, Suddenly, I, all of those things seemed to be uh, over, and Marge Patton called me, and mm -hmm. she said, would you consider being on the Capital Expenditures Committee? And I didn't know really what it all involved, and I said, well, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yes, and that was in the middle of the summer, it was a very beautiful summer day, and, and so that's how I got into Capitol. And then if you're going to be on a capital expenditures committee, you might as well run for town meeting. And you, you were so much involved at the library that they almost changed the name, but... <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yes, I was also on the advisory committee to the board of trustees of the library. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, if you are from Lexington, you cannot be on the on the board of trustees of the library, unless you're, you're a school committee member or a board of selectmen. Or a sitting or clergy. Or a sitting clergy. <laughs> I always like that. And when we, were, when we were on that committee, for a while we studied that to see if we couldn't change the structure. Well, of course you can't really. It's pretty hard to change that structure because it went through the, up to, I think, the Supreme Court of Massachusetts in the 1890s when somebody questioned the structure of the library. But at any rate, we never did change it. But I did get to know more about 
how the library worked as an institution, I think. My reasons for getting involved was sort of similar to, to yours, Shirley. Also, um, women power. My, my mother was the person, they were not political at all, but my mother was a volunteer and always, always had been, that was her. She would go to the Veterans Hospital and play the piano. She went up there for 50 years uh, on a bus, no car, all the way up, walked down to the uh, Bedford Hospital. And she worked at the school. We did have hot lunch at Adams when I was there. Oh. I think it was the first we school. Didn't and they, had, they used volunteers. My mother was one of the volunteers. And so just, she would always work at the polls. She, you know, she was, um, would never miss voting. And I grew up knowing that that was very important. And the thing that got me going, I think, in, in uh, getting in Lexington, political scene was uh, the League of Women Voters when I, uh, when I got involved there just to learn about what was this all about um, and how public policy is made and so forth. Um, I, I started watching town meeting. I'd go and that was in the early 70s. I was president in the middle 70s of the League. Um, but I would watch them and what got me going there again, they were having a big debate about housing, affordable housing at Idlewild. And that's sort of in my neighborhood, um, in yours. And she, um, and it got me upset when I heard people talking about. It. To me, it was very limiting. They didn't want to let people in and, and so forth. My backyard. We're here. Put the fence up. And my own background again was I felt lucky to have come to Lexington and through uh, my my grandparents selling us the house. And so um, I said, gee, I don't like the, what I'm hearing here, so I think I'm, I'm going to run for town meeting as soon as I get through being president of the league, because at that time we were kind of kept things separate. And so I did, and I've been there now 35 years-ish, and I love it because it's just, it's where, um, it, it tells so much about the town and what we believe and, and what we do. And once you're in town meeting, you know, I, someone asked me to run for school committee because one of the... Hoffman was retiring early, and I think Frank Michaelman and Bob Kent both called me and said, and when they call you, you listen, you know, yeah. and would you please run for that one term, one one year, actually. And I said, oh, you know, I never really wanted to be in the school committee. I'd probably think to myself, selectmen would be more interesting, but that changed. Um, so I did run, and then I, I ran for the next term. And then I got, recreation was something that, I have three sons, and um, we were always involved in sports. My husband was coaching, and it just seemed like a, something that meant a lot to me. I grew up in the town and learned to swim and all had the playground wow. experiences that you did. So recreation was a fun thing to do, and it, it wasn't uh, terribly time-consuming, um, as school committee was at that time, because we had problems. Um, so that's how it just evolved, really. It's once, once you get your foot wet, you know, your toe wet, <laughs> It isn't a, a big step to uh, to get a little more involved, and I just think it's important. I mean, I always have felt that if you don't like something, we had a we had a thing for the league where we pulled the duck in the parade and said, "Don't squawk, vote." Yeah, and mm -hmm. it's the same idea. If you think <clears throat> there are some things that could be better, then you you should get in there and help them be better. Yeah. Um, so that's that was it. You know about recreation, because. Uh, that's how I got to know you a little bit better yes. because I, one of my assignments on Capitol is to cover recreation. That's true. And we all take it turns is, covering is different on. things. And, and uh, actually, one of my very favorite projects was Lincoln Field because uh, I, when I was young, it well, was wasn't a bit controversial. Either. No, <laughs> it was more controversial than. Uh, but I never saw anything go through so fast as that one did. Yeah. It was conceived in, in November and voted on in the Springtown meeting. It's Thank an all-time record for goodness, getting something yeah. done. Yeah. Well, then it came back later to bite us for a little while and yeah. we had well, a special town meeting to again, reconfirm the, it. The, neighbor, the neighborhood issue is always big whenever we do anything in town and it's still still very um, important. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fact, always a problem. It always is a problem and people, you know, up in that they area. Think it's going to be the end of the world if did, something oh, changes. Oh yeah, we were going to ruin the whole thing. Now it's the jewel of, of our system. And, but I uh, <laughs> it was a recreation center for me when I was little though, because the dump was about was the dump. end of my territory. Yeah. And all kinds of people threw, they threw all kinds of interesting things away. 
<laughs> we need it for our activities, one sort or another. Oh, absolutely. You know, like orange crates. You can't tell what, you know, wheels. You wheels. can't tell wheels what you might find in the dump that was useful. Okay. And she <laughs> used to go over and check it out. I mean, really, it was just Don't one of those things. My family did not approve. In fact, I probably never told them I was doing it. But we really enjoyed going over Well, you can see why they We needed approve. things for our clubhouse. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, you needed things it was to over the top of the hill for me. With the little carts, the go karts, we used to build those on. I always wanted to have one. I always wanted to build a go kart, but my father was hopeless. He couldn't, you know, one oh, end of a screwdriver from the other. But <laughs> that was handy. So we, we no, my, my father was not handy. I was the handy one in the family. <laughs> I was, and <laughs> I remember taking my sister's music box apart. To see how it worked, it never came back together again. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Hmm? But anyhow, yeah. now uh, talking about going through the dump and finding all kinds of old relics, uh, I gather you saw an interesting relic one time. Oh yeah, one of the one of the most interesting relics that I ever saw. This was was when I was in fifth grade, and it was determined that I needed to have a wart removed from my finger, and I was sent to go to visit Dr. Piper, who lived right across the street. His, house, his office and his house were the same thing, right across the street from Hancock School. And uh, I did this on my lunch hour. And he really actually hurt me quite a bit. And as a reward for all the pain that he had caused me, he was our family doctor, he went over, and I couldn't figure out what he was doing, but he opened his wall safe. And he went inside the wall safe. It didn't look like there was much in there, but I don't know. And he brought out this little Elmwood, yellow Elmwood box. And he opened the top and he showed me this thing. And it was a tooth. And he said he had gotten that tooth when they moved the Minutemen, I believe, who had been buried in the old burying ground, and decided to take all the remains and put them under the obelisk on the green. And at that time, somehow, he had acquired the tooth. And that was my reward for having my <laughs> work. <laughs> I wonder what ever happened to that tooth. <laughs> We'd love to have that tooth today. I don't know. Frame it up and put it in the historical. I bet, I bet his son might have known. There might be some pipers still sitting around oh. somewhere. And you had an uncle who was. Uh, you know, my, my, uh, actually, my father's brother, Stanley, whom I, of course, never met. Um, when he was in college, he was at Dartmouth, and World War I had started. And there was a unit, of, a bunch of kids who were probably about sophomores at Dartmouth, who decided that they wanted to do something for the, for the war effort. And they decided to just form a unit to go over to France, and uh, they formed a, an ambulance unit and they went over to France to join the French army. And my father, who didn't trust my, my grandfather rather, who didn't trust Stanley, uh, his name was Stanley Hill, to be on his own. My father was at Cornell, he was, he was a junior at Cornell. Um, so my grandfather thought that Stanley should have Condress, my father, along at the same time. So they were both in this ambulance unit. And I think it was the Battle of the Marne, but at any rate, um, my uncle went out on a call with, a, with this ambulance. And he went out to p pick up some wounded in this battle. And on the way back from carrying this load of wounded people, he uh, took a shell, the ambulance oh. took a shell. He lay in a hospital in France, and my father would visit him. and. I had letters which are now at the Historical Society, and I don't have them with me to, to look at right now, about you know how his progress was and everybody thought that he was going to be okay, but he wasn't because he caught uh, spinal meningitis and he died really quite fast after that. And he was, um, at the time that he died, the Americans had entered the war and so Stanley was now transferred, his unit was transferred over to the American Expeditionary Force. And so uh, he died as an American soldier, and he was the first young man 
to die in World War I from Lexington. And there are little reminders of him here and there about town. There's a base of the flagpole, has a little marker at uh, Hancock Clark House. There's a window at Hancock Church that my grandfather donated. There's a plaque in uh, Cary Hall with the names of all of those soldiers who, who uh, soldiers or Marines or whatever they may have been, people who participated in World War I. And I believe that Bill Daly had a brother. He, no, who, his uncle. His too. uncle, mm -hmm. somebody in his family. Had that. He's right. the one that I, whose other na name I recognize. And I've always wondered what was behind that plaque on the wall at, at the... Yeah, at the Cherry at, Hall. At Cherry Hall. There's a little keyhole there, and I've often wondered who has the key. Oh. Mysteries. You have a lot of mysteries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and keys. But anyhow, well, Stanley, I guess, you know, he really was, apparently was a lot of fun. So I guess I missed a great uncle. Yeah. Well, it's too bad. I just remember his name from, it used well, to be. Well, the Post. The Stanley Hill Post. Yeah, right. It used to well, be. yes, they, 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 they named Stanley Hill Post but I mean, number 38. But it was, um, why would I know that? I'm not involved with it. But be, it was it's because just, of the 4th of July celebration that we always had and we used to have the races and I used to participate in them as a kid and it was the Stanley Hill Post was the sponsor of these uh -huh. and I remember on one of the ribbons that I have from from winning that's it the name is on there Stanley Hill Post which is why we used yeah, to, you know, to say, hmm. connections well this has been fascinating and wonderful and uh, there any bits and pieces that we haven't touched on that you want to add? I have no doubt that we could go on forever. <laughs> well, that's good, That's true. Good that's thing. true. No, I, um... Good. Well, many, many thanks. This was sensational. And... Well, I don't know about sensational. <laughs> well, I thought it was sensational. <laughs> I was very interested in Sandy's... Sandy's Living in a different, different, different neighborhood, different neighborhood. Mm -hmm.